If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles with me. We're going to go to 2 Corinthians. We're going to go to the first chapter, 2 Corinthians, uh, chapter 1, and we're going to begin reading at verse number 3. When you find that, you can stand with me for the reading of God's Word. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You may be seated. I'd like to uh, use tonight for a subject or for a title, Stand By Me. And as we get into this message, we'll begin to take a closer look at that. As I was thinking about this, uh, this message tonight, I just thought about how good God is. The service that, the service is not just one, the services that we have here on a regular basis. The fact that God would visit us, the way that he does. God truly is a God of tender mercy. As I was thinking about how good God has been to me over the course of my life, I've not ever deserved a single thing that he's done for me. I could get the worst of the worst and it's still not what I deserve. And as I thought about God, how wonderful and how merciful he is, I was drawn to this passage of scripture here. Blessed be God. That's a wonderful way to start, isn't it? Blessed be God. It says that he is the father of our Lord Jesus Christ and the father of mercies. We read this morning in, in uh, Psalm 136 about his mercy endureth forever. And I love that place in uh, Lamentations that says, uh, This I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. It is of his compassions. They fail not. His mercies are new every morning. I think about that every morning, all night, while I'm sleeping, no matter what has happened that day, that all night the mercies of God are washing over me. And when I wake up, I have a clean slate in the morning. That I wake up and I wake up with God. I woke up in many ways in my own self before I knew Jesus. I woke up a lot of different ways, and most of them were with, not with God. But God has been so good to me. And today I can say that he has changed my life and saved me, and I'm so thankful for that. I just want to call to remembrance the good things that God has done in my life. And I want you tonight, as, as this message goes on, the good things that God has done in your life. If you recount the mercies of the Lord, they've been so good to you. If you recount the wonderful things that God has done in your life, he's been so good to you. We don't deserve it. That's grace. Unmerited favor. God has given us such grace. He's seen me in my lowest estate, and, he's, and he, he remembered me there. Before I was ever born, God knew who I was, and he came for me. Praise God for it. Praise God for it. But blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I love that, that it says the God of all comfort. If you've ever been comforted, it's because God's mercy and grace towards you. If there's ever been a time in your life where there was a need and God, God was there for you, and it is His comfort that met you in that time. We have uh, such a wonderful, uh, such a wonderful God, and He's the only God. He's the true God, and, and, he, and we can serve Him and love Him, and we know that He is a God of all comfort. Notice in verse 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. You know, I look out across this room and I see people that each one of you have a story. Each one of you have a, a history of how God has brought you out of something, how God has been there for you in your darkest hour, how God has watched over you, how, how you can look back and see the hand of God has brought you through many different things. And and it's amazing that you can take those things that God's done in your life and you can see someone that, that reminds you of yourself at that point. 
How many have ever seen someone that reminds him of yourself? And you can say, listen, God was there for me, the God of all comfort, the God of all grace. And you can tell them about the wonderful things that Jesus has done in your life. I'm so thankful for him that he stood by me every step of the way, even when I wasn't trying to stand by him. He's never left us. He never forsook us. Let's look on down at verse number 9 of this chapter. It says, But we have the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Now Paul, of course, is also talking in the verses preceding this, the sufferings of Christ that he is enduring for the cause of Christ. He's talking about, he says in verse 8, I would not, uh, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. The apostle Paul says, even to the point where I was ready to give up, despaired even of life, But we can take this wonderful passage of scripture here where Paul took the comfort that God gave him in his nights of darkness and sorrow, the times that that he had, uh, we talked a lot about it this morning, of being beaten and bruised and all the different things that he went through. And the apostle Paul writes those things down for us and we can come here tonight and we can look at those and we can see where it says in verse 10 where he says, who delivered us. And it says, from so great a death, see, every one of us had that sentence of death in our lives because of sin. And God came to you in that time, and he delivered you from that sentence of death. But not only does it say that he delivered, but it says he doth deliver, meaning he is delivering you now. How many know that what God began, he's not going to stop? What he started, he'll perform until the day of Jesus Christ. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. Not only has he delivered us, but he is delivering us. Not only is he delivering us now, but he will deliver us. We have a perpetual deliverance. (laughs) Amen. God has given us, he's delivered us from our past, our present, and our future. All the things that we have done in our life, God has forgiven our past, he's forgiven us now, and he's going to forgive us in the future when we mess up. The precious blood of Jesus was shed for you and I because of that sentence of death in ourselves. But praise God, tonight he delivers us from that. I'm reminded of the passage in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, it says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. When you think about that, how wonderful it is that God will never leave us, he'll never forsake us. Now as I talk about, as I come into the more of the the bulk of the message here, we're talking about, uh, the title is again is Stand By Me. Now, just to kind of give us some history here, uh, in Acts uh, chapter 21, Paul arrives in Jerusalem. He had determined to go to Jerusalem. And after meeting the elders in the temple, he, uh, he comes to the temple, he meets with the elders, and it says that there were some Jews of Asia that stirred the people up and they laid hands on him. And uh, the Bible says that the whole city was moved and the people ran against him. You can find those things over in the 21st chapter of Acts. We won't go there. And... Uh, It says that they drew him out of the temple and they went to kill him. And while they're doing this, tidings came to the chief captain that the whole city was in an uproar over this uh, apostle Paul. The whole city was in an uproar and so the chief uh, captain, he takes soldiers and he runs down to them. And here these people are and they're beating on Paul. They're beating him at this point. When the Jews see the soldiers, they stop beating him. But Paul at that moment found himself having been beaten to the point that he could not walk. And as I mentioned this morning, this is where he had to be carried into the castle because there were many that were saying one thing and another thing and they couldn't make sense of it all. So they said, let's take him to the castle and figure out who he is and what he's doing and why he's doing it. 
And so he's at the point that he can't even walk, and they carry him into the castle. Now, as we go further on, he's, uh, he's in prison. He goes to trial before the Sanhedrin. And uh, there, there rises a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees because he says, I'm a Pharisee. And then they all, they all uh, kind of uh, start taking sides. And, and there's uh, uh, this big dissension. And, and they all get in an uproar. And uh, the, the, uh, the chief captains there feared that Paul would be ripped into pieces because of how, how heated that it got. So at this point, he has been beaten to the point that he can't walk. He's been put on trial. He's in prison. And uh, now there's all this uproar. And uh, in that moment, he probably could have been thinking, uh, maybe going to Jerusalem wasn't the best option. <laughs> he went there to preach Christ in the resurrection. And he could have been thinking, if one of you or I were there, we might have been thinking, did I make a misstep? But Paul knew that he was on the right track. See, he had prayed about it, and actually God had even warned him that if you go there, you're going to encounter difficulty in Jerusalem. But God was going to use this to get him to Rome, and Paul desired to go to Rome. But I want you to notice in Acts chapter 3, and this brings us to the first point. Stand by me in the night. Stand by me in the night. Acts chapter 23, verse 11. It says, in the night following... The Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. See here, Jesus stands beside Paul in that moment, in that dark night. Could you imagine that? Having all the things that's just happened to him, and that darkness of the night in that castle, and, and Jesus stands beside you and says, Fear not. Fear not, Paul. As you testify to me in Jerusalem, you're also going to do it in Rome. And here Jesus was giving him that assurance in the night. Say, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. You're going to get there. It doesn't look like you're going to get there. But you're on the right track. And Jesus stood by Paul in the night. How many would say tonight there's been some times where Jesus has stood by you in the night? Where you looked around at your circumstance and you said, oh... It looks bad. It looks bad. It feels bad. For Paul, it felt bad too. But Jesus was standing there in the night. Standing beside him. I just picture the Lord holding his hand saying, Paul, it's okay. It's okay, Paul, I've got you. That's how I see Jesus with each one of us tonight. It brings new meaning to that I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So Jesus is standing beside him there in that night. And I want to say to you in Hebrews 10, 35, the, the Bible says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. There may be some in here tonight that are worn down. You're wore out. And you need Jesus to stand by you tonight. You need Jesus to stand by you tonight and, and offer you some words of comfort. You need Jesus to stand beside you tonight and say, Be of good cheer. It's going to be all right. I believe every one of us have met that at some point. I want to say to you tonight, though, if you're, if you're in that place where you just feel wore out, we've all been there before. We don't have to be so pious where we say, no, I'm just a super saint. Paul said, I despaired even the life. He was ready to give up. The apostle Paul said that. We've all been to that place. We've all been to that place where we said, that's it, Lord, I'm throwing in the towel. And God says, go pick that towel back up. <laughs> I'm throwing in the towel, but never, ever give up. Here's, here's something I want to point out to you. In Luke chapter 22, verses 42 and 43, here's Jesus in the garden. And he's saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. It was in that time he prayed, and his sweat become, as it were, great drops of blood. And Jesus was in an agony, getting ready to go to the cross of Calvary where he would shed his blood for you and I, and he was in an agony praying. 
And in that time, Jesus never gave up. Jesus never gave up on you. And in that moment, I want you to notice that in that moment that that there was comfort brought to him and God will comfort you in the moment of your despair and your trial. And he'll also prepare you for what you're getting ready to face. He'll prepare you for what you're getting ready to face. See, with Paul, Jesus stood by him in the night. Be of good cheer, Paul. Paul was going to Rome where ultimately he would give his life for the Lord. Jesus was preparing him for what would come. Jesus will prepare each and every one of us for what will come. Yet, in Psalm 16, verse 7 and 8, it says, I will bless the Lord, who hath given me counsel. My reins also instruct me in the night seasons. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So we have Jesus standing beside us. We have the Holy Spirit living inside of us. And we have, the whole, we have the Heavenly Father up above us. What a wonderful trio. Amen? I'm also reminded in those times of, of uh, where you feel like giving up. I love this scripture in Psalm 121 verses 1 through 4. It says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. I've heard it said this way, in those nights that you can't sleep, since God's neither going to slumber nor sleep, there's no sense in the both of you staying up. Get a little bit of rest and let God take care of it. Get a little rest and let God take care of it. As I was thinking about this, stand by me in the night, I thought of the children of Israel. I thought of the children of Israel when they, when they had left Egypt and Moses led them up out of the, the land of Egypt by the hand of God. And they come to the Red Sea. And at this Red Sea was an impossible, it was an impossible situation. They had an impossible situation. They hit the dead end. Where do we go? You ever been there? They hit this impossible situation and they look behind them and there is a persistent enemy that just won't give up. There's a persistent enemy that just won't give up and they're looking around, how, how are we going to get past this? And then, and then God says, Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea. And in an instant, there's a clean, dry path that's made for them. In a place of impossible circumstances, suddenly God says, stretch out your hand, and God parts the waters, and he dries them up, and there's a wall on the left side, and there's a wall on the right side, and there was no place to go but the direction that God had them pointed in. Think about that. God's direction is that clear. In the moment of an impossible circumstance where the enemy is hot on your tail, God takes care of them behind you. He's, uh, he's going to take care of them. He's going to hold them back. He opens up the waters for you to walk through a clean, dry path where you can go right on through. He puts a wall on your left side, a wall on your right side, and says, go that direction. And then the enemy comes in behind, and uh, what happens? The waters fold up on him. They tried to go down the same path that you went down, but it'll never work because God said no. Praise God. That gets me excited. <laughs> God gives us clear direction. I love that. I love that. I pray, I pray when I'm trying to seek out something and, I, and I'm not sure how to go, I say, Lord, you put a wall on my left. You put a wall on my right that I can't go any direction except the one you want me to go. Lord, put up the bumpers on my bowling alley so I can make a strike. That's the only way I'll ever get one. <laughs> <laughs> Stand by me in the midst of my sadness and fear. Turn over to John chapter 20. 
Here the disciples were assembled having just seen the crucifixion of Jesus. Their master, the one that they had followed, the one that they had, they had been with all that time. And he had told them that he was going to the cross, but I don't think they clearly understood what he was saying. And here they were, they were assembled in this, this upper room. Luke says they were terrified, terrified and affrightened. But in John chapter 20, verse 19 and 20, listen to what it says. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. Jesus always brings peace. And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. So here they were assembled in uh, their sadness, their fear. Their Lord had been crucified. They were sad because of what they had seen, what they had experienced. There was fear because they didn't know if it was going to happen to them too. They were afraid of the Jews. And here Jesus shows up and he knows no boundaries. He comes into the place where they are assembled in fear. He does doesn't use the door he just walks right on in and there they are and he says peace be unto you yeah. Yeah. amen Lord I didn't see you come in there he didn't use the door he doesn't have to he has no boundaries he should have no boundaries in our hearts I've seen people try to go into a room without using the door and it's kind of funny but when Jesus does it, that's awesome. But he knows no boundaries, and he comes into the place where they're assembled in fear. And of course, he shows them his hands. I love that. He shows them that a work was performed. You realize that when he showed those hands, it was showing that a work was performed. Nail prints in his hands. You ever worked real hard, and you didn't wear your gloves, maybe driving fence posts, or hammering with a hammer and you look at your hands in a little bit and you've got blisters all over them you can tell that there was a work that was performed amen and Jesus comes over and he says look here I've been working for you he says look here I've been working for you look at my hands and he shows them his side and he was showing that it was for them his side was for them. Just as Eve was taken from Adam's side, so the church from Jesus' side. He comes in and says, I've been busy, guys, but I want you to have some peace. I want you to know that I'm alive and well. And he comes to them in the midst of their sadness and their fears. I love that because in Hebrews chapter 14, or chapter 4, verse 15 and 16, a familiar verse, we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Having experienced life, he understands life. Think about that. In your own life, the things that you're going through, having experienced life, he understands it. It's one thing if you go to a hospital room and you see someone laying in the bed and you've never laid in the bed and you say, I'm, I'll pray for you, I'm sorry, what's going on. But it's another thing when you've been in that exact place and you say, I understand what that feels like. I understand that pain that you're feeling. I understand what you're going through right now. And Jesus could come to us and he says, listen, I understand your pain. I understand your temptations. I understand the things that you're going through because I lived in a body just like yours. But Jesus, in all points, tempted yet sinless. 
And so we can say, praise God that he has experienced those things for us, that we have a high priest that, that uh, isn't going to ignore us. He, we come before God with, and boldly and we say, Lord, we need help. God, I need mercy. I need help. And he says, oh, I understand. He doesn't say, tough luck, get over it. He says, I understand you. I understand what you're going through. Praise God for that. Praise God for that. He's the God of all mercies, of all comforts. Stand by me in the midst of my doubts. Now, Thomas wasn't with him when Jesus came in. Look at John chapter 20, verse 24. We'll read down to verse 29. It says, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days again his disciples were within, and Thomas with them, then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. He always brings peace with him. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Jesus saith unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, thou hast believed. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet have believed. Jesus was saying, blessed are those that are sitting in Ozark Pool Gospel Church tonight at 3081 Selmore Road. You've not seen, but you believed. So in the midst of our doubts and fears, Jesus comes in. And he confirms with us. He says, look, I'm alive. I am well. You don't need a doubt. So many of us are, come to the Lord and we say, Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. We have needs in our life. Lord, I believe. Help thou my unbelief. And Jesus comes and says, don't doubt. Only believe. I'm not big on the fortune cookie Bible, as Chuck calls it. But I do like to pray with the Bible open. And one night I, I, uh, I was praying and, and I was seeking the Lord. And uh, I looked, opened the Bible up and I looked and, and there the scripture is. It says, I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Amen. And so I can say that at that time the Lord Jesus was standing beside me. And tonight you can see that he's standing beside you and he says, listen. I have loved you with an everlasting love. Oh, what a comfort to my soul it was. It may have been fortune cookie Bible that night, but it was good. And God is so good, and he'll meet that need in the moment that we need, and in the midst of our doubts, he'll meet that need. Blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe. And someday we will see Jesus face to face. You realize that, church? Someday we are going to walk hand in hand with him. Someday we are going to be with Jesus. We're going to look upon that face. Now we see through a glass darkly, but we're going to see him face to face someday. You mark it down. We're going to see Jesus face to face. We're going to be with him. We're going to see those nail prints in his hands and his feet. We're going to see the wound in his side, and we're going to stand there, and he's going to say, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Yes, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Don't be afraid to give him praise. He's worthy of praise. I think of that time where John the Baptist, he, uh, John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. But John the Baptist found himself in a prison house. And he sent two out and said, Are you the one or should we find another? And Jesus said, you go back and tell them the blind eyes are open, the sick are healed, the dead are raised, and blessed is he who's not offended in me. 
<laughs> Elijah had that problem too. After the miraculous event that happened at Mount Carmel, Jezebel says, you're going to be like all those prophets of Baal that you just killed. And Elijah runs and climbs down in a hole to hide from her. And, and, and I heard one preacher say, getting down in a hole has never made anybody any holier. But the Lord knew what his need was, and he rejuvenated and he recommissioned that man of God. And you may be in a place tonight where you need to be rejuvenated and recommissioned. And God can do that in your life. He'll, he'll visit you in the midst of your doubts. Something else I often like to think about, I love, I love the fact that in Luke 24, and I didn't give it to Alan, I thought about it after I'd given him my notes, but whenever Jesus leads them out as far as Bethany and he lifts up his hands and he blessed them, and it came to pass while he blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. But I often think about how his hands are there and across in the backdrop of that sky, how you could see the light coming through the nail prints in Jesus' hands. As they're lifted up blessing, the last thing they see is Jesus' hands lifted up blessing them. And tonight, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and He is making intercession for you and for me. Hands lifted up, blessing. Hands lifted up, blessing. Interceding for you and I. I love that, don't you? I love that. Could you imagine seeing the light shining through those nail print hands? Oh, my Lord. Which brings me to the last part of the message. Someday, I'll stand beside Jesus. He stands by me in the night, in the midst of my sadness and fear. He stands by me in the midst of my doubts. And someday, I'm going to stand by Jesus. I'm looking forward to that. Look at what it says in Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. There's coming a day where Jesus is going to take me home. Whether I go by the way of the grave or he comes back and splits those eastern skies tonight, Jesus is going to come and take me home. And there will be a day where, here, where, where I'm going to stand beside him and he's going to present me faultless before the throne of his glory. Glory to God. He stands by us now and someday we're going to stand by him. We're going to walk those streets of gold. We're going to see those walls of Jasper. We're going to live in that place where there's no more death, no more suffering, no more tears. We're going to be there, church. We're going to be there. We're going to see the pearly gates. We're going to see saints of old. But more than that, we're going to see Jesus. Glory to God. We're going to see Jesus. All the rest of that isn't heaven. Jesus is heaven. Jesus is heaven to me. We will never make heaven because of our goodness. We will make heaven because of his blood. His blood that was shed because of our badness, <laughs> our sins. He took our place. And I look forward to one day walking hand in hand with Jesus. And we can take comfort in the fact that God is a good God. He is a good God no matter what you may go through. Jesus is there with you. It brings me back to our original scripture. Blessed be God. As we think about all these things that we've discussed, we just have to say, blessed be God. You could say, praise be to God. Praise be to God for His mercy endureth forever. Praise be to God that He sent His Son to die on the cross for us. 
Praise be to God that our sins are washed away by his precious blood. Praise be to God that he's coming back to take us home. Hallelujah. I heard, uh, I heard it said like this, faith, you could say faith in this way, for all he is, I take him. For all he is, I take him. I'll end on this last uh, quote. I love it. I, I think maybe I've mentioned it before, but it says this. And in light of everything that we will face in this life, no one of us know what we're going to face, but Jesus will face it with you. He'll stand beside you. If you'll make your prayer, Lord, stand by me, he'll stand beside you. I believe in the sun when it does not shine. I believe in God when he is silent. I know the sun is up there even on the darkest day. And when darkness veils Jesus' lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. Are you resting on his grace tonight? Do you know that everything is right with the Lord? I pray that this message has comforted you tonight in some measure. I pray that it would. I know we've got many different things that we struggle with, but the Lord is there for all of them. I can't offer the comfort that you need. I can try to support you the best I can, but only Jesus can give you that comfort that you need. And we ought to lift each other up. We ought to pray for one another. And Jesus is right there for us. Go ahead and bow your heads with me. We'll pray this, this evening. Father, I thank you that you are the God of all comfort, the God of all grace. Lord, that you love us and you're right there with us no matter what we face. And Father, I pray for each one here tonight. You know the need. You know the things that they may struggle with. And God, I pray that you would meet that need and that there would be that reassurance, Father, this evening, Lord, that, that you are standing right there with us. Father, for the broken hearts, Lord, that you would comfort those hearts. Lord, that you would bless each one. Lord, just let us think back to the fact that you are so merciful and so wonderful to us, even though we don't deserve it. Lord, continue to move in our hearts. Let these words minister to us by your Holy Spirit. I give you the thanks for it in Jesus' name. Go ahead and stand with me. We'll have a song. If anyone needs to come to these altars, they're open tonight.